without further ado, I will pass over to Jennifer and to Cam, who will introduce the team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction before we hand over to Miguel and Farhad, who've done the lion's share of the work, and then at the end, Cam will um, provide a little bit of a summing up as well. Um, but essentially, just to give you some context, this is sort of the not the final stage, but has been the next stage in a project that has been ongoing for about five or six years now, where CSIC, the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, which I run, um, and CAM Centre, the Langer Rock Centre, had the opportunity to work with Network Rail and some of their prime contractors um, to look at instrumenting a bridge during construction and we instrumented everything on the bridge um, in fact we did two bridges and we picked them because they were two um, bridges that were representative of um, the kind of bridges that network rail uses across their network um, and what we were really looking at was first off by instrumenting them you know how over designed are our bridges for example so we were looking at the beginning of life and, and wanting to understand the real performance of a, of a newly built asset so that we could start to do things like calibrating our design models and so on but of course once we then had these heavily instrumented bridges it made sense to continue to monitor them through their life and one of our former research associates liam sort of coined the phrase giving giving an asset a health passport for its life so what we've got what we have is this unique opportunity with two bridges that we'd thrown a lot of instrumentation at more than you would probably typically use on a, on a standard rail bridge um, but a real opportunity then to use these as a research testbed the challenge that we had was the extent of the sensing was such that if we were going to be monitoring them continuously then we, was, we were getting very quickly into a big data situation um, and so we needed um, a, a better way of managing that data and we started collaborating with the Alan Turing Institute to use machine learning and so on but then we also wanted to, to be able to represent the data in a meaningful way and that led to us applying to um, CIH and CDBB for funding to help us to build a digital twin of these two bridges which is the project that you're now going to see more about from Miguel and Farhad and um, as always with these things it's been a bit of a journey because when you're out there instrumenting real physical things that are on a real rail network there's uh, all the fun of trying to get access to the bridge so we had to wait for closures on the line so that we could send people up there and they were working overnight and uh, I don't know if Farhad's got any pictures of any of that in his slide deck but um, a lot of uh, real life action on real life bridges happened um, so that we can now start to uh, so that we could start to accrue the data continuously um, and as you'll see we've got data now from well, we're capturing data from every train as it crosses the bridge live. Uh, we've got data from something like 17 and a half thousand trains, possibly more by now. Um, and if we continue to collect this kind of data throughout the life of the, of the bridge, then we'll be able to see it as it ages and we'll start to pick up. We'll be able to start to pick up uh, changes in performance of the bridge and therefore get a sense of, you know, what is the current capacity and loading of the bridge um, as it ages? what you know how how is that capacity being affected as we want to for example put bigger heavier trains on it or run more freight across it or what, what have you um we can make a really good assessment then of, of the bridge's capability to carry these loads um and you might say why is that relevant this these bridges are only sort of five six years old well it's relevant because we run these assets for 100 or more years network rail has 28,000 bridges and um, more than half of them were built before 1914. So we can anticipate that this bridge will be with us for another 100 or 200 years, um, all being well for humanity. And therefore, the needs that we place on it will change. And so having this kind of understanding of how these assets perform over the longer term is really important. Um, so that's enough from me. What you really want to do is see what Farhad and, and Miguel have to present. So Farhad, I think I'm handing over to you next, aren't I? And you're muted, so make sure you unmute yourself. You're muted. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Farad Senov. I'm a senior research associate in CSIC. So my background is in bridge engineering. Um, I joined the university about two years ago, and before that, I'd worked in industry for over eight years in designing, testing, and assessing bridges in CSIC. Um, I'm leading this um, um, exciting research project called Long-Term Performance Monitoring of Staffordshire Bridges, which is the main topic of our presentation today. My research interests are in um, um, developing bridge condition assessment techniques using direct measurements, traffic loading, digital twins and bridgeway motion systems, which I will talk about this throughout my slides. 
Um, so today with my colleague, um, Dr. Miguel Bravo Haro, we are presenting the results and the main findings from this exciting project, as I mentioned, called Long-Term Performance Monitoring of Staffordshire Bridges Using Digital Twins. This project is funded by, the current phase is funded by CDBB within Construction Innovation Hub, and it aims to demonstrate the practical application of real-time structural monitoring integrated with digital twin technology to quantify the performance of um, um, instrumented railway bridges owned by Network Rail. By the way, I'm sorry if I am, I haven't shared my screen. I apologize for this. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah. OK, perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah, so the motivation behind this research project comes from the shortcomings of the current practice for maintaining bridge assets. The current bridge condition assessment techniques largely rely on visual inspection, so such techniques only provide qualitative results and fail to estimate the actual load carrying capacities of bridges. And based on such techniques, thousands of bridges in the UK are reported as structurally deficient in some form, and some of them are put weight restrictions um, causing traffic delays. So these substandard bridges have a huge adverse impact on the economy and in the, on the environment, hence on the society. Um, however, um, previous studies um, in the literature show that most of the substandard bridges are actually much stronger than we think. For instance, um, the test load of 17 times higher than the estimated load was applied to the bridge in the US, and the results show that it had been decommissioned despite a significant remaining load capacity. And another bridge was tested in Sweden, and it could sustain almost five times the design load. So many similar um, case studies can be found in a very interesting paper called Bridge Testing is Surprise Every Time, where the authors proof tested dozens of bridges in Canada, and the results show that these bridges could sustain much larger loads than their estimated capacities. So understanding such sources of um, additional strength is always very important to quantify the performance of a bridge. They are mainly associated with many uncertainties involved in the industry code used for designing or assessing bridges, such as structural behavior, material properties, or loading conditions, and etc. And bridge engineers basically have to do, have to make um, lots of conservative assumptions to stay on the safe side. And um, for instance, let's take a look at the most basic traffic load model in Eurocodes, and uh, load model one, that all the highway bridges um, in Europe are designed to sustain its load actions. It has um, two axles spaced 1.2 meter apart and has a gross vehicle of 67 tons. And this is um, basically without applying the any load factor, which is another 30% increase uh, in, in gross weight. So although it's a smaller than a smart car, so this is probably the smallest vehicle, um, it's heavier than uh, the most common four axle track with maximum allowable weight limit of 40 tons. This is just a one example of conservativeness uh, involved in these industry codes. And when these conservative assumptions add up, it, le it leads to really extremely conservative results. And as a result, thousands of bridges are deemed structurally deficient. So to quantify the performance of a bridge, it was one of the very, very crucial uh, steps to eliminate such uncertainties as much as possible. And it's one of the main objectives of this project. So this project started several years ago when Network Rail um, had a project call called Staffordshire Area Improvement, aiming to reduce um, bottleneck where fast trains would have to slow down to, good, to let the goods trains to cross. Uh, Network Rail effectively built flyovers in two sites, Stafford and near Norton Bridge Village. And um, as part of the Norton Bridge project, 10 new bridges were constructed. So Norton Bridge um, is a composite half-through bridge with steel I-shaped main girders and cast in situ reinforced concrete deck um, designed as a simply supported structure and spanning 26.8 meters over an, over an existing railway uh, line. Whereas the Chepsey Bridge um, is, a, is a shorter span bridge with 11.9 meter bridge span crossing a strait of water and is made of um, precast pre-stress main girders and cast in situ reinforced concrete deck. So they are basically the two most common bridge types in the UK in transport network. So our researchers instrumented both bridges with fiber optic sensors during construction stage. So Norton Bridge was constructed on site and our 
researchers instrumented the um, um, installed the sensors at the uh, on the top and bottom flanges of the main girders cross beams. We also embedded some fiber optic sensors into the reinforced concrete deck while it was cast on site. Um, three slippers were also instrumented um, while they were fabricated in the precast facility. So overall, we have 291 FPG sensors um, measuring strains and temperature. In the case of Chepsi Bridge, since it's a precast concrete bridge, the sensors were embedded um, uh, inside the um, uh, main girders um, at the precast facility before they were brought to site. And at the construction site, our researchers also instrumented deck slab while the concrete was poured. Plus, we have um, here three sleepers as well instrumented with FPG sensors. And in total, we have 220 FPG sensors on the bridge. So the first two phases of the project, which has now been completed, mostly looked at the feasibility of fiber optic sen um, sensing system for long term bridge monitoring. We initially didn't have um, a permanent power on site that would allow us to develop a remote monitoring system for the bridge. So initially data was acquired during short site visits and that involved setting up a tent next to the cabinets containing the uh, FPG cables and using a generator as shown in the figure where Liam Butler, one of the previous uh, researchers involved in phase one and phase two project recording data during one of these um, short site visits and early data acquired from the bridges were used to investigate the time dependent material properties such as pre-stress loss and creep and shrinkage, load effects due to constru uh, stage construction and load distribution um, path across the deck structure. Then in 2020, we received uh, funding from CDBB to develop a long term performance monitoring system for the Staffordshire bridges using digital twins. So the digital twin, as defined in the uh, Gemini's principles, it's a realistic representation of the physical asset in the built environment. So in our case, it's the uh, Staffordshire bridges. So the key aspect uh, of a digital twin model is the connection between the virtual and the physical twins. And uh, this was established by feeding continuous monitoring data into the digital twin system in real time. So then our digital twin system, which is integrated with advanced data processing algorithms, process raw data and transform it into a useful format or useful information such as realistic conditions occurring on the bridge side by eliminating those uncertainties that are typically included in the conventional um, bridge assessment methods. And we eventually determine information that bridge owners are interested in such as what's the actual load effects the bridge is, is experiencing, how much structural capacity is utilized and what if there's any remaining strain capacity and et cetera. So developing the digital twin first required setting up a remote mon uh, monitoring system on the bridge side. Initially, we didn't have a uh, permanent power on site, so we liaised with network rail and the power was installed at the bridge site in January 2021, which enabled us to develop a, a, the data acquisition and transfer system for continuous monitoring um, um, system as shown in the, in the figure. So the remote monitoring system was installed in November last year. And uh, since then we have um, acquired site monitoring data um, during the crossing of more than 18,000 trains and our database is getting uh, bigger each day. Um, while network rail engineers were working on site installing permanent power, we used this opportunity to install some additional sensors to develop a real time train load monitoring system on the bridge side. So we've been actively collaborating with network rail throughout the project. During discussions, it was confirmed by network rail that accurate traffic loading information will be of benefit to them. Uh, and as there is no um, existing live tra train load monitoring system in use um, on the UK railway network. Plus, since traffic loading is one of the main sources of uncertainty, so obtaining site specific loading was also in our interest. So setting up a train load monitoring system required some additional um, um, information such as axle positions of passing trains, which wasn't possible to obtain using the existing system. So we developed a new axle detection system using laser range finder sensors. So basically laser range finder is a sensor that measures distance to a target by beaming light at a very high frequency and they were installed at the start and end of a bridge pointing in the transverse direction. So the idea is that 
And when an axle enters or leaves the bridge, it will cut the beaming light uh, and be, that we use basically to determine the presence of axles from the time history signal. And in addition to the axle detection system, we also installed some high-grade accelerometers, which can be used as inclinometers, and we use it to capture the, um, um, the bridge uh, end rotations uh, in order to obtain realistic boundary conditions. This is another um, um, source of uncertainty that uh, could reveal significant strength reserve. Plus, uh, we also ins um, um, installed some webcams showing the footage of passing trains and the temperature and humidity sensor. So overall, the sensing system on the bridge consists of accelerometers, cameras, FPG sensors, axle detection system, and temperature and humidity, humidity sensor. And um, basically, they, they capture data during train crossings. So data acquisition system collects time-synchronized data from multiple sensing units. And achieving accurate time synchronization was um, one of the, was another challenging task that we had to overcome when we designed the hardware components. Then the acquired data um, is transferred to the database uh, using a 4G uh, connection, where um, our digital twin system processes data using integrated data processing algorithms, and the results are presented in the web-based dashboard, um, which we have developed that also contains and um, 3D visualization model of the bridge. So we have developed various um, data processing algorithms that take the raw site monitoring data and transforms it into information that's required for some structural assessment. So the bridge um, engineers require various parameters um, to carry out structural checks. So using these algorithms, we obtain, for instance, curvature, bridge uh, end rotations, displacement at any um, point along the length of the main girders. We obtain train axle weights, influence lines, for instance, which are the true representation of the structural stiffness, dynamic characteristics, and so on. So in the next slide, uh, I'm going to present how we determine the train axle weights, and my colleague, Dr. Miguel Bravo Haro, will present the live output from these um, data processing algorithms that we have already incorporated into digital twin software. Uh, the train axle weights um, were obtained using a technology called Bridge Wave Motion Systems, or BBIM in short. So BBIM is a system that uses site monitoring data from an instrument bridge, and in a sense, it converts the bridge itself into a weighing scale to predict the axle weights. So broadly speaking, uh, the algorithm solves an inverse type problem where um, deformations induced by vehicles are measured and axle weights are back calculated. So the algorithm is based on the influence line concept. So influence line, it's a, it's a unique structural property representing the unit response of a bridge at the sensor location. So the installation first um, involves um, system calibration. First, deformations induced by a test track um, with known axle weights are used to obtain the influence lines. And once the influence lines uh, are known, then the, during the operation phase, the only unknown in the expression becomes the axle weights, which basically the bridge wave motion algorithm predicts. So that's pretty much the working principles behind the BWIM systems. So to calibrate the system, we use data acquired during a during the crossing of the new measurement train, or the nickname is Flying Banana due to its yellow color. So the Flying Banana is a train that is uh, instrumented by laser scanners, accelerometers, and gyroscopes, and it regularly travels across the network to assess the condition of railway tracks, and it has fixed axle weights. So the video footage shows uh, the crossing of the train. It, it shows um, the laser scanners beaming light um, on the railway tracks, taking valuable information about their condition. And the axle weights provided to us by network rail is shown in the column on the right hand side. So the axle detection results are shown in the left bottom float. Um, so the spikes, so these two spikes um, correspond with the passage of a um, of, um, of, of a, a bogey which has two um, axles. So the Bottom plot on the right hand side shows the typical stream time history sig signal we get from the FPG sensors installed on, on the bottom flange of bottom, top and bottom flange of one of the main girders at the mid span location. And these red and blue data markers basically, it's the projection of ax uh, axle detection results showing the axles entering and leaving the, um, uh, the bridge. For instance, in around 16 seconds, we know that four bogies have entered. Yeah. 
the bridge and one has already left. So with this information, we can and um, we basically were able to accurately obtain the deformations and also locate the, uh, the um, axle positions. And with this available information, we obtained influence lines at plus 200 sensor locations. So for instance, the plot uh, on the right hand side shows the influence lines at 20 sensor locations uh, attached to the bottom flange of one of the main girders. So once the unit response of the bridge was determined, um, then uh, we were able to set up um, the live train load monitoring system. At the moment, we can determine the accurate axle weights of any trains crossing our bridge site. So for instance, the video footage shows the crossing of a class 350 commuter train at a very high speed, so it's uh, 90 miles per hour, and the predicted axle weights are presented in the figure below. Um, it has 16 axles. Um, the actual gross um, train weight specified in the manufacturer specification is 175 tons. And this train crossed the bridge site on a Sunday morning. So we assumed that um, the train is mostly empty and the system determined the total um, weight, uh, total train weight as 181 tons, which is less than 3% um, error. Um, the, this video footage shows a crossing of a freight train uh, with um, 50 axles. The, so the first um, six axles correspond with the passage of a freight locomotive, which has two bogies and each bogie has three axles. And the remaining bar plot basically corresponds with the passage of um, freight wagons, which in this case it's fully loaded. Uh, we occasionally get these heavy steam locomotives crossing our bridge sites and out of 18,000 trains crossed our bridge sites so far, um, they typically cause the maximum load effects on the structural elements according to our observations. And this is due to basically the hammering action these trains cause on the, on the bridge. Um, overall, this project has significantly evolved through several phases. This is one of the few st studies in the literature where we are able to monitor a bridge from its construction phase and throughout its early service life. And then the train load monitoring system that we have developed at the bridge site is the first successful implementation of a permanent live traffic load monitoring system based on the bridgeway in motion technology. So currently we are able, we are in a place uh, where we can monitor both the deformations of all sorts of parameters at plus 300 sensor locations and, and the axle weights causing these deformations in real time. So the current phase of the project, which is funded by CDBB, is coming to an end, but we have received further funding from the Korean government and we will continue conducting cutting edge research on the Staffordshire bridges in collaboration with the research group from Chungang University. So existing digital twin system opened new perspectives in the bridge structure health monitoring field and we've just started exploring its full potential to help basically bridge owners um, efficiently maintain their aging bridge stocks so bridge owners operators are very keen to get answers to questions such as what are the actual load effects the bridges are, are exper experiencing and how much is the, um, the structure capacity is utilized and if the, there is any hidden strength reserve of the bridge that will be useful to increase the network productivity. This can be achieved by, for instance, increasing the train speed or easing some of the um, existing um, um, the weight restrictions. So these are the questions that as an industry we haven't been able to answer up until now, but with the system that we have developed, now we are able to address some of these questions. And my colleague, basically Dr. Miguel Bravo Haro, will discuss this point through a, through a live demonstration of the digital twin software that we have developed for the Norton Bridge. So before finalizing my presentation, I would like to acknowledge uh, our team for their immense efforts put in this um, exciting project. So developing a digital twin system requires multidisciplinary skills and forming the right team was the key for the successful completion of this project. So Paul Fiddler um, is our senior computer associate that overcome every single challenge we faced throughout the project and developed the remote monitoring system um, for the bridge. So Vladimir Bilt um, is a computer uh, vision scientist and he, uh, he, he helped us with designing the camera and the axle detection system. My background is in bridge engineering and my research interest in the bridge condition assessment techniques using direct 
measurements, traffic loading and bridgeway in motion systems. So Dr. Miguel Bravo Har is a structural engineer slash uh, data scientist slash uh, software de uh, developer. So he developed the entire digital twin software from scratch, which wasn't an, 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 an easy task. Um, and we were supervised by Professor Cam Middleton and Dr. Jennifer Schooling. We would also like to thank our research associate, Dr. Sam Cocking, um, for all his help during numerous um, site visits. And we would also like to thank Network Rail, particularly Natalia Alexieva and Chris Talbot, and many other people actually who put enormous efforts and time to support and accommodate our every single request, including providing permanent power on site during unprecedented times and giving us site permit access in many occasions that was very tricky to arrange. So it involved closing the railway line for several hours during overnight possession when we needed to install the necessary sensing system for this project and even afterwards to visit the bridge site to fix all sorts of challenges that was thrown at us. And last but not least, we would like to thank everyone in CIH and CDBB for all their and help and support, which without its successful completion of this project wouldn't be possible. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will pass the stage to my colleague, Dr. Miguel Bravo Haro, who will um, will give the live demonstration of the digital twin system. And if you have any questions, we will be more than happy to answer them afterwards. Thank you very much, and uh, over to you, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you, Fagad. That was fantastic. Uh, a very thorough. Uh, presentation of the history and the future of this project. So now you are stuck with me, guys. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen um, for the live demonstration. Um, let's see. So can you see, guys, the dashboard? Yeah. Fantastic. OK, so I can take this off. Um, I'm just timing myself because I don't want to bore you. So. First of all, thank you very much, Fagad, for such a compelling description. Um, and for today's live demonstration, I will show you around a set of um, online control rooms or dashboards that we have developed to basically track different key aspects um, of this project from sensing system itself um, to the actual structural performance uh, of the bridge towards the end of, of the demonstration. And as my colleague Fagad mentioned, this is an ongoing project, and this set of dashboards will, will soon come together to, to be part of a close and centralized um, self-contained uh, digital twin. So done, done with a brief uh, preamble, we can start with the first dashboard, which we have in front, in front of us. So this, this first platform is informing the general state of the set of databases that we have as well as the state of the sensors via visualizing sensors, uh, raw data, uh, as we'll see in short. I need to say, first of all, that all these dashboards are web-based online systems and are automatically updated when a new train has crossed. And uh, we will see that uh, happening live in, in a bit for there are no strikes today. Um, so we, we have just a simple, a simple clock here and we always have a timestamp of the last train that has crossed the bridge. This, this top panel is just simply showing um, general information, showing the number of trains um, per, day, per day over time. So um, it's, it's simply general information about the total number of, of trains recorded by the system. Um, the main plot shows the number of trains per day over, over time since last November, last year, as, as Fagad mentioned. Therefore, we've been continuously monitoring for over 10 months. Um, and since then, we can, as you can see there, we have on average between 60 to 70 trains per day. And yesterday we had, we, we reached 18,000 recorded trains. Uh, as you can see here, the, the peak of trains per day was uh, observed um, in November last year, it reached 92 trains. Um, and we can do a close up to the last month of, of data and you can see gaps with 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 day, or gaps of days with no trains, and most of them um, due to the last strikes. And from from here, you can select any day to basically uh, get information um, on a specific day. Um, that automatically updates the bottom panel, 
to get the timetable and um, a, a counter of trains per day. Um, we can use this calendar as well as, as, as a tool to move around the data set. And, and from, so you can request any, any of the previous um, um, uh, information. Um, and by simply clicking here, you have date timetable, counter of trains, and here you can select any, any, any video, any, sorry, any train, recorded train. And by selecting here, you can display um, first footage from the cameras, which are installed in both ends of the bridge that we saw before. Um, and automatically you see the raw data from accelerometers, FBGs, so the fiber optic uh, sensors, and the laser uh, range finders. And within each one of these um, uh, sets of sensors, we can do individual inspections as well, because um, we have four accelerometers. Um, each one of these has uh, three components, as you can see here, longitudinal, ver vertical, and transversal. Um, the same for the fiber optics, we have uh, over 16 um, fiber optic cables installing different uh, structural components of the asset, amounting to over 290 individual uh, FBG sensors, which are uh, shown here. So you can visualize data for each individual uh, FBG. And finally, we have four laser range finders. So um, here we have the option as well, as you can see in these buttons, we have the option of downloading the data that uh, we have selected. So we can actually select some data here. We can download this data if you wish. Um, nonetheless, this feature, um, you, you download the data in an Excel file. Nonetheless, this, this is a very limited feature because um, um, an end user might want to download data for 1,000 trains or for the entire data set. Um, so actually, to do that, we provide um, um, end users with a simple URL which is um, basically powered by, by our API, which is our wheelhouse of, of data, uh, which is the same system that is uh, uh, fetching uh, data into each one of these dashboards. Um, and yeah, basically you, you can fetch data, large volumes uh, of data um, in an scriptable way. And with that, we can move to the next dashboard, which is this one here. So this, this one is, uh, became um, it's is for zooming into the recorded data um, and especially the state of each one of the 80 um, fiber optic sensors installed across uh, top and bottom flanges of of the main state girders. Um, this this dashboard gradually became a dedicated system due to the significance of the main girders in the bridge structural performance, as we will see briefly. And once again, here we can navigate through the database to fetch any of the previously recorded trains. Um, and, and from this 3D model, uh, we can select any pair of, of, of sensors, of the 80 sensors by simply clicking on them. And that updates the, the time history of the Delta strain. Um, at the same time, in the bottom panels, we can see the magnitude of the strain of all sensors at the same instant at any time by just moving this slider, which is basically the time of the um, mimicking the crossing of the train. So basically, the, the, the plots here, which are simply um, the, the, the sensors across the, um, the girder, resemble snapshots of the deformed shape um, of, of, of the girders as the train crosses. Um, so this is uh, a small one. We can move, move on to the next a platform dedicated to the uh, bridge wave motion system. So here, the, the top part is the same as before. We have, we have this for the moment in a separate module because we don't want to mix a raw data like in the first dashboard. We process uh, data already, which it's, it's uh, coming from um, some, some processing algorithms. Um, in front, by default, you always get the latest train available. and the very last train, which cross at 217, is not available in the Bridgeway Motion system. This is basically because the current version of the system, it's only working in one of the tracks. We have the new version, we just haven't deployed it. Uh, so I'm just going to show you the last uh, process one, which is today at uh, 10 to 2. And 
as, as, as Fagad explained before, the, the system, it's always reporting number of axles, which are here, in this case, 16 axles for, let me show you the train. Um, it's 16 axles, the axles position, which are the ones here. So from the uh, beginning of the train to the end of the train, individual weight of axles, which is the magnitude of each one of these bars. And of course, the cumulative gross weight of, of, of we can calculate the gross weight of the train by simply getting the cumulative of all these bars, which um, you can have it uh, all the time here. Um, at the same time, you get the speed of the train and the position in which one of the of, of the tracks it's um, it's it's crossing on. Um, and as in the previous dashboard, here there is um, I mean you, you saw it already. We we kept the video here, the the video footage because it allows us to um, contrast immediately the results of of them of the bridgeway motion system. Um, and I want to before moving on to the next dashboard. Um, I want to do some train spotting together because it could be interesting for you to have a better idea of the rolling stock pool of, 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 of um, structures that are crossing the bridge. So the first interesting one we spotted on the 28th of February. So we are going back here a bit. Um, so 28th of February at 9.12. Um, so it would be this one. So this one, as you can see, um, it's an sort of almighty um, freight train of almost 2,000 tons, and it has 78 axles uh, spanning over uh, over 330 meters. Uh, so um, an interesting one. I have we have the this steam locomotive from the 26th of March as well that has attracted a lot of attention. Um, this one crossed at 11.39. I have a, a cheat sheet here with the interesting ones. So this is a massive um, steam locomotive that does this um, touristic heritage circuit around the network, as, as Fagad anticipated before. Um, and although the current version of the Bridgeway Motion algorithm didn't work for on this train for several reasons um from the fbg sensors of the of of installed in the in the main girders we know that this very train has imposed one of the largest structural demands as we will see in the next dashboard and the very last one that i want just, to share just before with you, you go on miguel for the for the yes. geeks among us that was tornado yes i forgot to mention Possibly. the name yes <laughs> thank you jennifer um so and the last one it's we spotted on the 22nd of April in the night, so no footage because it's pitch black here. But it's interesting because this is the longest train that we have observed, so long that we are actually struggling with the visualization, as you can see. Um, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there is no footage because like most of um, freight trains, they cross overnight, so they do not dis dis disrupt commuter trains during the day. And this one weighs over 2,000 tons and has 162 axles that um, are across uh, a, 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 an almighty length of 750 meters. So it might well be that this train is still crossing the bridge. <laughs> and so now we can move on onto the last dashboard where we are progressively adding new uh, features for the structural health monitoring features, uh, analysis of, of the bridge. So then we'll start from the bottom part because here there is some useful information that we've decided to, to include. So then when we design a bridge according to current design regulations, such as the Euro code, for a bridge of these characteristics, we need to satisfy, we need to satisfy two limit states, which means that the structural performance of the bridge needs to comply with a set of predefined criteria. The first one of these is the serviceability, meaning that vertical deformation needs to be below a certain threshold so that there are no structural changes that might affect the functionality of the train, such as changes in vertical and horizontal track geometry or excessive track, uh, track stresses, among others. 
and for this for this bridge, this this limit corresponds to 44.7 millimeters. And here we 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 are um, um, showing the the equation that controls this. Um, and moreover, within the serviceability limit, we have another um, limitation, which is um, it says that the vertical deformation needs to be under control so that passengers do not feel discomfort during excessive vibrations. And for, for our bridge, that um, limitation is 37 millimeters. And we have a second limit stage, which is the ultimate limit state that controls the potential structural failure of the bridge. And the way of doing this during the design stage is to amplify the anticipated permanent and live loads by a safety factor in order to obtain so-called factor loads. And for, for this bridge, and, and just this because I, I don't want to get too technical, the controlling failure mechanism is the lateral instability of the top flange of the main spill girders, also known as lateral torsional bucket. Um, we are monitoring right now both uh, limit states in the following way. We'll start with the vertical deformations. Here you can see the limits of both uh, vertical deformations. Sorry, can can you are you still with me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Ah, sorry, because my my laptop froze froze for a second. Um, so here you can have you can see both vertical deformation limits um, in this in these lines here. Um, and for so this is um, the those are the limits for the serviceability of the of the limit state of the two main steel girders. Um, and each one of these dots in the in the plots here. Um, represent the maximum vertical deformation for a given life train. So you can see that we are well below both threshold for the entire uh, rolling stock that we've recorded for both the girders, the east main one and the west main one. And as you can see, the maximum um, deformation ever recorded, it's almost eight millimeters, as, as you can see here. Nonetheless, if you if you see the histograms of the maximum deformations, magnitudes above four are very infrequent, and most of those are due to the freight train. So most of the deformations are, you can see the means of the different distributions, which are mostly the different classes of commuter trains. Um, and now here at the top, um, and only at the top because it's um, more critical as a structural performance indicator, we have the utilization ratio of the main steel girders, which is the ratio of the structural demand to the structural capacity. On the one hand, we know the structural capacity of the controlling failure mode from the design of the bridge. And on the other hand, we can estimate the demand using the delta strain collected from uh, the FBG sensors. Sorry, uh, it seems to be freezing here. Are you are you still all with me? Yeah, we're still with you. Fantastic, thanks. So, um, as I was saying, we can estimate the demand using the FBG data from the main girders, and it's important to say that trains um, represent live loads, but actually we have measured as well the dead or permanent loads for the sensing system was installed at the beginning of the construction of the bridge. So we are taking those into account here as well uh, as observed uh, data. Um, and naturally, as the name hints, the utilization ratio provides a transparent metric of the percentage of the capacity being utilized or the complement of that, which is what is the remaining structural capacity. Therefore, not only informing the current structural state of the system, but providing the essential information needed for eventually increasing trains weight and speed. And as you can see here, it's the same logic as, as before. The maximum utilization ratio ever recorded is lower than 15%, meaning that less than a fifth of the structural capacity is being used at the moment. 
Um, and again, most uh, of the utilization factors for commuter trains in, in, in this, you can see it in these histograms, are way lower than that maximum value. Um, and some, some ideas about, about the utilization factor concept. So um, even, even if I happen to amplify the measured live loads that we, we have uh, out of our bridge wave motion system by let's say 1.5, which is the safety factor used for the design of this bridge in order to comply with design regulations for, for the ultimate state, the maximum utilization ratio would still reach only a 21 to a 22% because this is a linear relationship, uh, which is still less than a quarter of the capacity of the system. So the first source of discrepancies between this and design assumptions is that the live loads that we've measured are lower than the imposed by the load model used for design as Fagat explained in detail um, in the first part. Moreover, even if we were to observe the same factor live loads used, used for, for design in the bridge, they wouldn't cause the same structural performance due to the myriad of simplifications and assumptions made during the design. And this leads to the actual capacity of the structure as a second source of discrepancy with respect to the design. So in consequence, these are preliminary results that we need to validate with a calibrated finite element model of the bridge so that we can estimate especially the capacity of the system for both limit state serviceability and, and ultimate limit state, but using a performance-based design approach where the actual failure in the model will inform the load that we produce or has produced uh, the, 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 let's say the, 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 the collapse and not the other way around, right? Um, and finally, uh, I want to just give you a glimpse to the very near future of this project because all these are um, features and methodologies that we are developing at the moment. We are working on several additions for, for the digital twin. The first one, it's an online model, model analysis system. These are again, preliminary results for natural frequencies and critical damping. Uh, here I'm showing the results based on the first 10,000 trains. Um, for this, we are using mostly time series from, time series from the accelerometers. Um, we are working as well on an online unsupervised early damage detection system. We are developing a calibrated finite element model, which will update the actual capacity of the system. We are working on a train classification algorithm. Here again, uh, showing some preliminary results using half of the trains database, uh, capable of classifying, uh, identi identifying six different clusters of trains. Um, and here is how, how we envisage one of the online control rooms for condition monitoring, where everything that I've shared with you today will coalesce. So basically, you don't need to be jumping through dashboards. You will have this uh, control room that will inform you about the state of, of the asset. Um, here I have some final remarks that I'm just going to leave it here. Um, I hope I've, I've managed to give you an idea of, of the potential of sensing technologies and, and digital infrastructure. And I hope uh, with the discussion about the utilization ratio, uh, I would have uh, provoked uh, some thoughts. So over to you, Tom. Thank you ever so much. Well, I, I, I will briefly pass uh, straight back to, well, before I pass back to Jennifer and or, and or Cam, it's, it have, has anybody got any questions that they would like to ask the team? Keith first. Off you go, Keith. Well, firstly, can I say to, to Fahad and Miguel, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. You have collected some really good data. And I think the next step, and as you talked about the follow on stages, is, is what to do with it. And I've known Jennifer and Cam for a, a very long time. Uh, and if I characterise them and I'll grossly simplify uh, uh, that, that understanding, Cam would really want to put more stuff on the bridge uh, <laughs> and Jennifer would really like to take some stuff out of it. Can we sort of you know, in terms of what you've drawn from your prim results, can we say 
uh, for example, that we are adding an extra 30% of carbon into our bridges or 60% of carbon into our bridges through this conservative approach, or from the other perspective, we could get 80% more utilization or you know more out of it. Can we can we sort of put that into outcome type statements from the, the, the preliminary data you've got so far? I'd really be keen to know about how much we are adding in terms of unnecessary stuff based on the current operating parameters and i'll be really interested to see how much we could do in terms of add more uh, to the sort of the operating uh, constraints that we put onto those those presents i think they're really huge amount of potential and that's and having such a sort of wealth of data uh, you know, and it is a wealth of data. And my goodness, you've collected quite a lot of data there. You know, so I think that that really, firstly, congratulations to you and the, and the team, both on the presentation and the work you've done. It's fantastic. And really, I'm really keen to explore how we can then utilise what you've learned so far to either, you know, make sure we're not putting as much unnecessary carbon into things or to keep CAM happy, we can put much bigger axle loads through it. So what's the sort of, you know, how do we keep access uh, to that ongoing uh, outputs that you're producing, but thank you again for fantastic presentation. Do, do you want to answer there, Farhad? First, I'd, I'd yeah. like to comment yeah. afterwards. But you go first, Farhad. No, please can be up to you. Okay. Well, firstly, um, as usual, Keith, you've gone straight to the juggler, you could say, and hitting the key point because, as we've all known, in all our infrastructure, particularly our bridges, there's a perception that they've been overly designed, very conservative provided we can be aware of potential problems with you know, damage or deterioration, how can we access the value inherent in that conservativeness? And we've been trying to do this for 30 years. So I'm absolutely thrilled at seeing, for what I, from my perspective, for the first time I've seen anywhere in the world is a real-time permanent um, installation which is accurately and demonstrated to give accurate results of the measurement of the axle loads, of the number of loads, and also the performance of the structure. So for the first time, we're getting real data to understand the performance of the structure. And really, it's confirming what all of us knew in that they're grossly over-designed. We have this huge reserve capacity. And just as you said, Keith, the economic consequences of that a massive. I mean, Farha or uh, Miguel put up the we use utilization ratio showing you, you know, less than 20% of on the metrics he was using. But that's showing the opportunity to, as you've said, dramatically, potentially dramatically increase our axle loads and carrying far more goods, far more economically. And that has huge consequences, which translates into massive carbon savings as well. But the second factor as well, of course, is speed. When you talk to the operators at high speed one, high speed two and network rail, you put up the loads, you increase the speed, you improve the performance. Now, there are all sorts of other factors to be considered, but the key point is we've got the data, we've got the evidence, which no one has ever, ever, anywhere in the world been able to do before. This is really quite unique. And it opens up so many questions and opportunities for, to recognise other areas for improvement. As Farhad said, let's relook and build up the confidence to review how we do our codes of practice. And this introduces the idea we may be able to reduce the factors of safety, huge economic consequences. And if we've got all of the sensors that CSC, CSIC is talking about, you can actually monitor and check that it's safe. So this to me is a really significant bit of work. And the only thing I'd like to add in there though is this has evolved not just over six years, but we started work on this um, over 15 years ago and it's a long journey. And we've had one of the challenges of research is so often you have a project, you get some postdocs, outstanding people doing work, comes to an end and it stops. And this is where the benefit of CDBB and CIH's support has been massive because when we came to you, and Keith, you were very much instrumental in this, where this is the opportunity to take it forward, and having that support from CDBB, supported by CIH, made us, gave us the opportunity to get through to where we are. And you can see now the Koreans are coming in, wanting to take this forward, and we need collectively, nationally, to recognise the potential for this sort of um, system to create value for our operators across the bridge network.
Brilliant. Thank you, Kemp. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? Um, I would just add two short sentences. So, Keith, yes, absolutely. We can use data like this to knock carbon out of our bridge designs. Um, because even if we want to be conservative, I would argue we're being hugely over conservative right now. Um, the other thing is that it's potentially a, um, a revenue generator as well, because, for example, we've been talking to people at HS1 and if they want to bring other kinds of trains onto the network, uh, you know, other other um, operators, their trains weigh different amounts and have a different impact on track wear and that sort of thing. Whereas if you use a bridgeway and motion system like this, you could start to charge different amounts per train depending on the weight uh, in the same way that you know we claim mileage on our cars for wear and tear you could claim um, mileage on the tracks for wear and tear as it were um, so there's there's a range of ways we can use this kind of data um, the trick is we've now got a tool that can start to demonstrate some of the value of this data for a whole range of different things be they operational or maintenance or what have you brilliant Thank you. Uh, just a couple more hands, so I'll go to Steve Nesbitt first. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd resonate uh, Keith's comments. Fantastic piece of work, very informative. The the, the value of it is also um, useful in terms of the existing bridge infrastructure in the UK. Um, we, we've got a whole suite of bridges, an awful lot of what of those are deteriorating will need replacement at some given point in time and we haven't got an objective way of determining the priority for those replacements so having real data about real life duty cycle load cycle strain uh, um, uh, energies etc that that bridges are um, uh, uh, um, subjected to is very very important for us to try and objectivize the lifespan of a bridge even more so with the national imperative of going to net zero 2050, decarbonising freight, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to shift loads of stuff onto rail and rail capacity will mean a far greater footfall of traffic. So the distance between trains is going to have to be reduced with autonomy and various other technologies. So this becomes all the more important. How do we assess the longevity, the permitted service life of a bridge and therefore objectifies the end date for that bridge. When does it need to be replaced based on real life data on, on how much of its fatigue life, let's say, has been consumed on an annualised basis? That kind of information is absolutely critical for the infrastructure. Can I just um, respond to that? So, Steve, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there. Um, and we're actually looking at creating a similar digital twin for an existing bridge that we've instrumented. Obviously, existing bridges, it's a little bit different because you have to fit the, the sensing on the outside of the bridge. You're not fitting it, you know, internally on a as, as we were able to do with those two bridges. But we've got quite a lot of experience of doing that now. Um, and again, you know, as we want to upgrade our services, for example, you know, we've got a huge upgrade job happening in the north of England at the moment, the Trans Pennine upgrade. And an assessment has had to be made as to which of the, the bridges on that line are adequate for the future service requirements, need some sort of um, treatment or retrofit for the future service requirements or need replacing. And that assessment has been done on the basis of essentially visual inspections because we, unfortunately, we only kind of discovered that they were doing this a bit late in the day. Um, but for the next big upgrade we do, really what you want to do is look at a line like that and say, well, OK, which of the bridges on this do we think we should be monitoring now and monitor them for a year or two to make real informed decisions about actually what the right decision is to make about a given bridge? Because that might mean you avoid doing anything to a bridge. So you'd save right there all of the money that you'd spent on any kind of monitoring. Um, you might realise that you can retrofit a bridge rather than replace it. You know, you can you can repair a bridge rather than replace it. So there's a huge potential for saving carbon and saving money and saving time if we can start to be proactive about this. I will go back to what I said before. You know, as Keith said, I'm always one for um, being a realist about this kind of thing and saying, well, we can't put this level of sensing that we've done on this bridge on every bridge, but we can do and you know we can assess a bridge and then decide what sensing you want to leave on it for a period of a year or two to get those good informed decisions. And I think there's a real potential in that. And there's a huge, you know, there's, a, there's an industry to create around it as well, you know, that you can. We shouldn't <laughs> ignore the fact that it, it's a node within a network. And if you've got yeah. objective real-time data at a node, you can infer other yes. nodes. 
Yeah, you can. So, so, becomes... so you can get a sense of the, the, the loading you can definitely do from nodes. But you, you can also assess specific bridges for a period of time to, to understand really what yeah. the, the detailed intervention may or may not need to be. Um, and it yeah. also would mean you could get around some of the horrific things that National Highways have been doing by just pouring concrete under a bridge. Perhaps, but you know. <laughs> Thank you. I've oh, got one more question. Uh, Anma, over to, to you for your question. Yes, uh, thank you for all your reports and uh, very good presentation. So, uh, first of all, I am a PhD student uh, from University of Exeter uh, working on uh, structure of monitoring of bridges. And actually, I have uh, some questions. Uh, firstly, about the digital twin model. I'm not quite sure how you is it is it your digital twin model it is a combination from black box model and the white box model so as you may know that right white box model is it uh, a fully parameter parametric based model like for example finite element model and black box model is it a fully um, data black box model that, that uh, gathering data and interpret the data by similar some algorithms. So we got the gray box model by combination the two methods. So I'm not quite uh, understand. Is it your digital twin model mixing uh, white box and uh, black box model? This first question. The second question is about I see that the, the real time data started from November 20. 21 and uh, what about the environmental effect uh, i see in your dashboard there is no mention for environmental effects for example thermal load load as you may know that thermal load for long term especially for bridges uh, effect uh, on durability the magnitude of thermal load response has been found in many cases to be equal or larger than traffic load. I mentioned traffic load. Um, it may be different from the train load, but the principle is the same. Thank you. I hope. Is it clear the question? Yeah, thank you. I'll, 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 I will have to definitely pass over to the team to answer that, the, <laughs> those questions. <laughs> Uh, over, so the, well, the question I think is, is it a black box or a grey box or a white box model or a combination of them? And then the second question was, have we accounted for thermal loads? Yeah, yeah. So maybe can you deal with um, the first of those? Yeah, I can, I, can, I can answer both questions. So first of all, thanks for, for, for pointing out this. I'll start by the last one. We have uh, multiple um, sensors measuring temperature on site which is the, the, the main environmental parameter that I, I guess you are pointing out to. Um, we just haven't um, incorporated it into the dashboard that you saw, but we have all the recordings since the beginning. So it's something that will be there um, relatively soon. And definitely we expect for it to play um, a big role. That's to answer your second question. And about the first question, um, I'm not familiar with the concept of white, black and gray boxes, but I would say that our um, digital twin, it's a combination of all those. Um, we've developed it from scratch. Everything it's been, um, it's powered by open source systems. Um, so, the idea is that eventually this platform will be able to be used. Uh, people will be able to use it um, in other assets um, in a simple way. It's it has some principles at, at, at its core, like modularity, so it can keep growing. And this has allowed for us to keep incorporating um, different features. Um, and I would say a combination of those. If by black box you mean artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on, we have that. Is If by white box you mean only observed data, we have that as well. Um, 
and yeah, we'll have um, the, the the finite element model as well, which you could say it gets close to a gray model because it combines um, computational data and observed data. Yeah, so so it is in separate way. Yeah, it is same. The principle is same, uh, Doctor Miguel, because the only only pure white box model it can be represent the digital twin and only white black box model it is also can represent the uh, also digital twin combination of both in somewhere because there is two methods to combination of the, the two methods maybe promise uh, this is a promise method for its structural height monitoring okay i see i see what you mean this that's very very good explanation from you and uh, thank you thank you thank for you. your answer yeah thank you um i've got one last i'm conscious of the time and i know uh, a lot of people are gonna have to jump to other meetings but i'll go over to mark pickering now you've got a question as well mark yeah good afternoon I'll, I'll try and keep it quick then um spot on excellent presentation some really really good technology there um the reason for my question really is i suppose one can you share the slides uh, <laughs> and two how quick <laughs> I asked, I work for this company called Skanska UK, so we're involved in the renewals portfolio works for Network Rail, and we, we are constantly looking at bridge replacements, and this could be an absolute game changer. So if we can get involved and support in any way possible, please, please let me know. That would be really interesting, Mark, because um, one of the challenges we found in the various projects that we've done with, for example, Network Rail is, you find a root asset manager who's got a specific problem and they're really keen to solve the problem for their one bridge, um, but getting it looked at in a sort of more strategic way is quite challenging. So, so the, very the interested in having that kind of a conversation with you. So the network really changing models are moving to a thin client's approach and there's more emphasis now on asset management by the tier ones. So we're going to visit the tier two, three, four, five years worth of work. So if we could start to look at prioritising potential potential sensor, sensor surveys on some of the structures over the next five to ten years it's it could put us in a really strong position so yeah, I and I just Mark, can I just suggest we make sure that if you contact Farhad and McGill with your email and we'll follow up on that because that overlaps and we're also working parallel with Scanska and another a couple of other projects but I wasn't aware of your connection there so please contact uh, our team and we'll take it forward from there absolutely thank you Brilliant. Thank you, everybody, ever so much for, for attending. And just wondered whether Cam or Jennifer's got any final words they want to say. Uh, but I will say thank you to the team for some outstanding work. It really is outstanding work that you've done. Um, I've really appreciated learning about it as I've been here with, with CWB, and I'm, I'm glad we've been able to share it with everybody else as well. So thank you. But Jennifer, Cam, if any more words from you too. I, I I'll just finish off from our perspective and saying one that you know, both Keith and what Mark just said highlighted what this is all about. It's for the first time getting data to provide value to inform decisions and it opens up so many opportunities. So this is really just the start. Um, but I also should acknowledge um, as supervisors from Jennifer and my point of view, you know, the absolutely outstanding work that's been done by Farhad, Miguel, Paul, um, Vladimir and the team, and previous to that, it's been over a number of years. We're just very fortunate enough to have really first class, outstanding professionals who have led it through to a conclusion rather than just stopped, written a paper, and got on with it. And I think Mark hit it on the head. You know, th th this is just the beginning with a, a very wider approach of fulfilling CSIC's objective of really providing the information and the smart sensors and information to inform decisions. So it's a really exciting start for the future. I don't think I could add anything to that. Thank you, Ken. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for your time and, and for joining the presentation and have wonderful afternoons. Thanks ever so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.